your mouth to? Uh, I think they might do it. Oh, I think they do it. Yeah, yeah that's you won't do it. Yeah. yeah. Good, BB. Tim, do you want to sh after start Hi, your BB? BB, yeah, super rich. When Tim starts, yeah. Um, when do you want to? Sh you finish when you want to. You don't have to be panicked, yeah. Yeah. Do you want? When do you want a time signal? Do it. Do it from when he starts, not to stop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Yeah. How long? What time do you want to know when you've been talking? How long do you want to be warned? Two minutes from the end. Only? So no, five minutes. Maybe even up to the five. Oh, okay. Five minutes. It's 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 and green. Yeah, let's do five. Uh, five. Let's do five and three. Okay. okay. Yeah. But then, Tim, don't. If you go one or two minutes over, it's not a problem. Yeah? Okay. yeah if you go ten minutes you know. over, yeah. it's a problem. Yeah. 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 So we do it one hour? Give him one. Give him one at twenty. Sorry? Make it twenty five minutes. Oh, yeah. not twenty five. Okay. You're not being pressed. Yeah. Okay. So um, when Tim. You don't need to stop yeah, abruptly, yeah, but yeah. you know, I, if you've still got 10 minutes to do, I've got that. then you've got a problem. Do you want, I mean, you've got, how long is the run you've got? Are you, are you happy with, do you need any time warning? Or you're happy, she's happy, so it's okay. Okay, okay. so you don't need to warn me before the car is actually okay. Great, thank you. What time is it now? Good afternoon, everybody. Could I ask you to take your seats as we get towards the last two substantive sessions um, before we go into our closing ceremony? My name is Paul Griffiths, and I um, coordinate scientific work at the EMCDDA. And it's great, my great pleasure to introduce the two closing substantive sessions. And we're starting with something a little bit special, a little bit different uh, for Lisbon Addictions. It's the first Richard Hartnell Memorial lec uh, Lecture. And I want to start with just a few personal words of introduction. Lisbon Addictions is intended as a European conference, but with an international outlook. And when I look at some of the amazing work that has been presented this week, I'm simply gobsmacked by the creativity, the ambition, and the practical utility of some of the research and practice that we are developing now in Europe. 
But I'm also old enough to remember this was not always the case. And the reason my organization exists was in part the recognition in the late 1980s that policies and actions in the drugs area could be far, far better if they were underpinned by more science-based understanding of the problems we face. This session then provides an important opportunity for the EMCDA as an organization, but also for many of our staff, particularly our more senior staff members, and certainly me personally, to remember, to celebrate, and also I think importantly to acknowledge the seminal contribution that our former colleague and dear friend, Richard Hartnell, has made to the European drugs field. It is often said that success has many fathers, but failure has, is an orphan. But when I look at how my organization operates today, and more generally the way we now approach drug issues in Europe, it is very much in line with the vision that Richard was you know, arguing for and promoting from the 1980s onwards. When I discussed this session with Professor Michael Farrell from NDARC in Australia, he remarked, and I think quite accurately, that many people simply don't really appreciate how influential Richard's work has been to shaping our modern approach to understanding drug use. This series of lectures is intended to re remedy this. Those of you who knew Richard will know that he really would not relish all this public attention. Richard, mate, I'm sorry, but you really do deserve this accolade. Richard was born in Bristol, England in 1947. There can be a certain academic snobbery in the UK about which, which university you attended. Richard was, of course, too modest to engage in that sort of thing. But for those of us, those of us who have, were the privilege to have seen his CV, we know that he had degrees from Oxford, Cambridge, and the LSE. You can trump that if you can. In the 1970s, he worked first as a psychologist in the drug dependency unit at UCL before moving to the Addiction Research Unit at the Institute of Psychiatry. I can imagine, as someone familiar with the, both the old ARU and Richard, that this was probably quite a challenging period for all concerned. In the 1980s, Richard moved back to UCL and then Birkbeck College at the University of London and became Senior Research Associate at the Drug Indicators Project. Inspired by the work of CEWG in the America, and the, this pioneering group really established the basic elements of the approach that we still work with today. The project started to develop and test a package of indicators and methods for assessing the nature and extent of drug problems at the community level. They also started to explore indirect statistical methods to quantify hidden populations. Richard subsequently moved to work in Barcelona and became a driving force behind the Pompidou groups of the Council of Europe's expert working group on drug epidemiology. And the group's multi-city network adopted the multi-indicator approach to community epidemiology, which it had pioneered in London. In a paper in 2003, published in the Bulletin of Narcotics, Richard comments on why this approach is so important. And if I may, in his own words, a fundamental but often overlooked point, regardless of whether indicators are standardized or not, it's only possible to make sense of them, to make comparisons and to draw conclusions if statistical data is combined with other, often more qualitative research, as well as broader information on context and including an understanding of societal responses, attitudes and attitudes. Subsequently, the work of the Pompidou Group using this kind of approach informed the establishment of my own organization, the EMCDDA. Richard was a founding member of our staff, our first head of epidemiology, and he introduced the multi-indicator approach to analysis that we still use today. As someone who worked with Richard over a number of years, I can say with no hesitation, he was clever, sometimes a bit chaotic, always challenging you, but in a really good way, innovative and highly creative. There really was no box big enough to, that could contain his thinking. But he was also generous, supportive, and cared deeply, not only about the topic, but the people that it impacted on. At the EMCDA, we all miss him. As much for his personal qualities, his generosity of spirit, his sense of humor, as, as, as much as for his academic guidance. 
and I cannot think of a better epitaph than that. We wanted to acknowledge the debt we owe to Richard with a series of lectures that reflected his vision and innovative approach to the field. We want the Richard Hartnell Memorial Lectures to engage critically and imaginatively with a topic. We want this lecture to create a platform for thinking about new ideas and for thinking differently. I'm therefore extremely pleased to introduce Professor Tim Rhodes. Tim works as a Professor of Public Health Sociology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and has also has an appointment at the University of New South Wales. His second ever job in London was as a research assistant at the Birkbeck College, where he worked closely with Richard. Tim will be inviting us to think critically, as well as differently, I think, about early warning outbreaks, a topic that we very focus on nowadays, but often don't stand back from that and look at it more critically in terms of a theoretical perspective. In, in doing this lecture, Tim, I think, is going to look at the science of early warning itself and ask us to consider should we be thinking about it differently? Could I ask you to give a warm this benediction? Welcome to Professor Tim Rhodes. Thank you very much, Paul, and to the Conference Scientific Committee for this opportunity um, to give the inaugural memorial lecture in Richard's name. Uh, it's truly an honor. Uh, I knew Richard for over 30 years, in fact. I moved to London in 1989, as Paul says, to work with Richard um, at the Drug Indicators Project, which is a project which he uh, created. My job there at the time was to look at the development of community outreach and peer outreach in responses to HIV in London. Um, Richard at the time was pioneering epidemiological indicators work, both at the Drug Indicators Project but also at the Council of Europe, Pompidou Group um, and beyond. I only worked with Richard for around two years at Birkbeck because Richard went on to take another position um, at the Institute for Medical Research in Barcelona in 1990, but I kept in contact with him socially and last saw him uh, in November 2019, uh, actually a, a little while after uh, this conference, uh, the, last, the last one. The image you see on this slide is, is one of Richard's photographs. Um, it's been selected for us by Dagmar from his portfolio. Dagmar is Richard's partner. Um, and it featured in an exhibition of of Richard's in Sintra, which is not so far from here. It's one of his landscapes. Um, and as many of you know, Richard left EMCDDA in 2020 to take up um, his, his new life uh, as a photographer. So Richard um, was responsible for setting up the Department of Epidemiology at EMCDDA. Um, if I can get this to work. There we go. And in fact, what we have here is some handwritten notes of Richard back in 1995. This is the front page of like a six, seven page proposal document which Richard put together uh, for the Department of Epidemiology and what it was to become at the EMCDDA. I rather like this slide because for me it speaks to me a lot about Richard and his style and the fact that he might have done this without a computer while in the mountains in Pyrenees. Anyway, uh, the lecture itself, I've been given the um, opportunity to, to think differently and to try and push some boundaries uh, in our thinking as it relates to early warning and, um, and outbreaks. So, so hopefully um, this lecture will be quite speculative and it will gesture towards some new or different thinking. I'm going to try and draw some connection between my work in sociology as it relates to drugs and infectious diseases and outbreaks and the pioneering work of Richard on epidemiological drug indicators. I'd like to acknowledge from the outset Kari Lancaster, who's my co-author on the work we're doing on outbreaks and outbreak science. So to get to the main point um, into the lecture itself, the main point is to consider the configuration of outbreak as a problematization. I know it feels quite late to having sociology on a 
Friday afternoon after three days of conference, but I hope you can <laughs> travel with me. So by this, we mean to ask, what does the configuration of outbreak do? What does it mean to enact a problem as outbreak? And by enacting a problem as outbreak, how does this problem get seen and governed? So basically, we're asking, how does outbreak see? And how does outbreak govern through how it is put to use? And we're asking this question in order for us to speculate on how we might see outbreak differently. And today, we're going to address these questions, as Paul implied, by looking at the narratives and the practices of early warning science itself. So we're turning our thinking about signals and trends a little bit on its head. Rather than seeing early warning as the means by which we might detect trends out there, we are instead looking in the in here of science for signals and trends on outbreak and how these ideas might be shifting in time. So let me give you the conclusion at the very start. We're going to conclude that a new approach to early warning in its broader sense and outreach might be possible, an approach which attempts to see outbreaks in long view and one that can see the slow violence of outbreak. That's the basic argument. And we're going to be speculating that early warning might extend its focal point, looking into the longer past as well as longer future, as well as expand its field of vision, looking more broadly and more ecologically, if you like, and not only proximally and locally. So that's kind of basically what we're going to travel through in the next 20 minutes or so. Our case example will be US overdose deaths. And I think most of us here are probably familiar with this slide. This one comes from the CDC. And it illustrates a long entrenched epidemic of opioid overdose in the US. It shows a trajectory of half a million overdose deaths over the past 20 years, in which around 70,000 people died in 2020 alone. And this narrative of epidemic, again, as many of us will know, is often narrated in in three waves, with wave one in late 1990 seeing a rapid rise of prescription opioids to treat chronic pain, uh, linked to the aggressive marketing of opioids for pain relief by pharmaceutical companies and enabled by weak regulation. Wave two from 2010 and onwards um, seeing opioid prescriptions stabilize at high levels but then emerging heroin overdose uh, combined with increased heroin availability. And then wave three from 2013 onwards, seeing fentanyl and synthetics coming into the mix. So that's going to be our case study. So let's talk now about some ideas on how we might think about outbreak and how we might think about outbreak differently. And we're going to be thinking across viruses and drugs here as we go. So outbreak. First, I think we can characterize outbreak uh, by its emergence and indeterminacy. In outbreaks, there is unpredictability. The harms potentiated, potentiated in an outbreak event, they're imminent, they're yet to arrive, they're unfolding. They're not an if, but a when, an anticipation. All outbreaks, whether framed as crises, emergencies, or as smaller ruptures, enable anticipatory governance. So that's our first point. Second, outbreak. Especially when configured as a crisis, like a pandemic, for instance, it can reach beyond the local with threats that are amplified and upscaled by globalized connection. When configured as a crisis, outbreak draws attention to a problem that extends beyond the local. And third, outbreaks can imagine catastrophe unknown threats of monstrous potential. Again, pandemics are a good example of this. An outbreak configured as crisis constitutes a problem that, if left alone, extends beyond the near and now. So outbreaks, especially when configured as a crisis, are early warnings which frame the scale and complexity of the problem as urgent, as well as extending beyond the routine, beyond the local, and beyond the near and now. So in early warning, as we know, including in the drugs field, speed is of the essence. Thinking of outbreak as a form of governance, we can see three tendencies in its temporal logics in terms of how it thinks with time, if you like. Yeah. 
First, it enacts a proximal and short-term horizon. Outbreaks are kind of new, they're, they're now, they're of the moment. Second, it enacts a sudden problematic rupture. Outbreaks break out, if you like, in unwanted and dangerous ways. And third, they call for rapid and precautionary response. Outbreaks require immediate control before they get going. We can easily trace these ideas in um, the speed and preparedness and control narratives of, of early warning, including in the drugs field. So we're told, for instance, that it's the foresight generated by early warning systems that makes Europe prepared, and that we need more, faster, ra rapid risk assessment around the clock, and so on. So it's taken for granted that outbreak is a narrative of preparedness Enab enabling a rapid reflex or a fast response of precautionary control. And a synthetic opioid fentanyl is often put forward, as on this slide, as an example of why this is so important when it's inadequately controlled, for instance. Now, the idea of speedy control um, uh, as a taken for granted in narratives of outbreak and early warning it might kind of even seem a bit strange to be commenting on this because it's so obvious, it is so taken for granted, it's such a given. But I think we can consider alternative configurations. So our approach, as I said, is to look into the narratives and the practices of early warning itself as traces for how outbreak might be configured and configured differently. So in this approach, as I said, outbreak is not presumed to exist out there waiting to be discovered or waiting to be detected by early warning technology. Rather, it also comes to be in the in here of the narratives and methods of early warning itself. And an instructive and very quick example of this here might be the 2019 H1N1 swine influenza pandemic and the work of anthropologist uh, Kezia Barker. She traces how the anticipation of this pandemic was generated in the surveillance and preparedness apparatus itself. Swine flu is an example of a projected pandemic that never came to be outside or beyond its early warning problematizations. This early warning generated a reflex precautionary response of massive proportions with massive investments in pharmaceutical vaccines of dubious efficacy that were stockpiled and never used, so much so that the WHO was accused of faking projections uh, to boost pharmaceutical industry profits. But there are other examples of similar pandemics like this. But if we see outbreak as an event made in the science of early warning itself, I think it means we cannot take for granted that outbreak is necessarily a short-term, time-bound rupture that only demands a rapid, short-term reflex response characterized by speedy control. Let's look a little bit more at how our early warning is enacted in the drugs field. Now, as we can see on this slide, you can see the number, but probably not much else because it's so small. The EMCDDA is currently celebrating 25 years of early warning. So it's a good time to be speculating, I think. But if you look at this infographic as a kind of narrative, if indeed you could see it, um, our first observation is kind of blindingly obvious, uh, and that's that the focus of early warning in the drugs field is the drug. The drug is the substance of outbreak, if you like. If we trace through this infographic in a little bit more detail, we see a history, a story which is told in relation to substances, emerging new, redesigned, and mutating substances, our variants of concern, if you will, from ecstasy to current matters of concern uh, in relation to new opioids, benzodiazepines, and synthetics. So the foundations of early warning in the drugs field are material indicators or captures of substance itself, such as seizures and chemical identifications. Nothing of this is new, and the, you know, the attention on the materiality of the substance makes sense. It seems entirely obvious. But there are alternative ways to think about outbreak. So picking up on some signals within the field itself and some of the more recent writing around early warning, we can speculate uh, how we might see beyond substance, beyond drug, if you like. How do we open up early warning beyond the drug, 
beyond chemical detection to a broader problematization. And if we start thinking like this, we let other things in, other things come into view, other actors beyond the drug, as well as social conditions, of course. Now we can trace this drift towards problematizing the substance to a bigger narrative, which is um, quite familiar to most of us here, but is a big feature of early warning writing and critique um, of late, and that's the narrative of the problem of complex complex complexity. And I don't need to focus on this um, in too much detail, uh, but there are two main elements. First is complex substances, that substances are increasingly less stable, more fluid, open to mutation, to masking, to variation, biochemical syntheses, for instance, that uh, makes them easier to conceal and to move. Uh, the very object of substance is under challenge. And this is a challenge for early warning systems, obviously, uh, if they rely on their capacity to detect distinct substances one by one. What were once traceable substances have now dissolved into an ecology of interchangeable molecules. And second, there are complex systems. Markets are fluid, becoming more dynamic. They're expanding very fast, increasingly virtual, diversified, globalized, as well as pharmaceuticalized making them more challenging to disrupt as well as to regulate. So here, for instance, in many reports, greater complexity uh, is, ex is expressed as an effect of technological developments intersecting with globalization kind of connections as well as uh, the pharmaceuticalization of markets. So our second observation, it intersects very closely with the first, and this is that not only might early warning be speculating on how to move beyond substance, it's also speculating on how to move beyond the local. So how do we open up early warning beyond the near and proximal to a broader problematization of outbreak that is emergent in a longer term trajectory of market, technological and other trends that create the social conditions for outbreaks to occur? So we see then signals in the field of early warning itself, <coughs> which are indicative, signs if you like, signals, call them what you will, um, that suggest a reimagining of outbreak towards a longer, broader view, which takes in the social forces and trends of outbreaks, combined with a more futures orientated view, which makes early warning less time lagged, less reactive and more preemptive. This is an invitation then to see outbreak differently in relation to temporality, but also to spatiality. It signals a move to stretch the focal point in relation to time and proximity, and to broaden the field of vision in relation to space and ecology. It signals an alternative outbreak, one less constituted in time-bound sudden ruptures or breaks from the present, happening in the short term, proximal, local, and now, to one that is instead constituted in what we are calling the long view. So let us look at some of the instances in the field of how these shifts might be happening. I'm going to look at two very briefly, obviously. The first is prediction, and the second is speculation. Prediction. So as the extracts to the kind of right of the slide illustrate, um, prediction is increasingly presented as a promise, if you like, of prevention through preemption. And there are many examples of this, including in the field of opioid overdose um, causation and prevention. And many of them have been recently re reviewed in relation to the US opioid overdose crisis, specifically by Charlie Marks, Anique Borquez, and colleagues at UCSD. And as their figure here illustrates, the move is to look to the future in time, beyond risk assessment and early detection of outbreak, to its forecasting. Prediction, of course, is a taken for granted in outbreaks. We all, we all know this, and we saw a lot of it in COVID-19, for instance. It's a short-term forecast, and it's presented as being grounded in the, in the more or less known by empirical indicators whose veracity and accuracy are said to be certain enough to enable statements of probability. In fast-moving viral epidemics, short-term forecasts are usually restricted to weeks. 
in efforts to predict opioid, opioid overdose, an outbreak in the coming year might be forecast based on the past six to 12 months. But the key thing about prediction is that its evidence-based credentials rely specifically on their capacity to link with empirical observation in the recent past to protect against kind of wild uncertainty of longer term or more speculative scenarios. So the work of Annick Borquez, Charlie Marks, Natasha Martin at UCSD and so on um, speaks to the promise of, of, um, of, uh, of prediction. It shows that recent detections in changes of drug supply can be linked to subsequent overdose presentations and deaths. It shows us that retrospective analyses over the past year can make overdose deaths more predictable or predictable in the next year. And for the first time, these kind of models are being wrapped up into national early warning systems, indicating where outbreaks might next occur. But addiction, as I'm implying, is no long view of opioid overdose. In fact, predicting to prevent accentuates a short-term perspective as necessary to enable a rapid and tailored local response, as the quote on the right there suggests. So short-term prediction is couched in an emergency local rapid response. Viewed alternatively, however, we can suggest that prediction, rather like outbreak, enacts a temporal cut in the long view of outbreak. There's a danger, I think, that problems become configured through prediction as short-term in their origins and short-term in their solutions. So early warning here is seeing outbreak and temporality in very particular ways according to what is measurable. We therefore see epistemological certainty overriding a longer and more ecological view of outbreaks evolution. And consequently, it's common for these kind of studies, including those I just mentioned, uh, not to say so much about social determinants, and also to say that they can't say much about social determinants. So the problem of complexity here becomes repackaged, if you like, as a black box of difficult to see or understand social determinants. Here's another graph of opioid overdose in epidemiological long view, and this is from the work of Jalal and Burke, um, published in Science 2018, although this particular graph actually comes from some of their later work. But they present this, and they say it, it presents a dismayingly predictable exponential uh, which grows over more than four decades. You know, we can see the ups and downs of different hazard rates or spikes in the epidemic uh, linked to the kind of waves I mentioned earlier. But according to them, these tend to return to this smooth but slow and deadly exponential of, of outbreak, which is anything but short term. And in their various studies, they acknowledge that this 40-year exponential, to quote them, is purely statistical. They say that the drivers of this remain largely unknown. But they say there are surely long-term processes at work here, and they speculate that they are social and economic in orientation. Now, we can return to these kind of speculations on causation later, perhaps, but the main thing to notice is that speculation is at work. We are moving from the predictable to the more speculative, from the probable to the possible, from the empirical measurable to that which could not be so easily epidemiologically empirically grounded. And in doing so, we move from the temporal and ecological cuts limited by epidemiological prediction. So a second trend that we're seeing in the field, we believe, is a move towards speculation. And we can see this very much so in the growing interest in the field in something called foresight and foresight methods. So I'm just going to say a couple of very quick words on foresight. It's variously defined, uh, and it's basically a deliberative exercise among experts, although it can also be research, and it tends to involve horizon planning of emerging drivers and signals of change in combination with scenario development. Um, which are often very qualitative in orientation, which build narratives, if you like, of plausible and possible futures as alternatives to deliberate around. 
they can also produce futures, which people might say they want to get to, and therefore they might backcast in order what actions might be done in order to try and get there. So the key features, though, although we're not going to look at it in detail, uh, is that we've got speculation of the plausible as well as the possible. We've got alternatives. We've got multiple forms of expertise involved, including beyond the epidemiological. We've got a participative approach, which involves dialogue and deliberation across multiple forms of expertise. And we've got techniques which model and map uh, futures and narratives of causation or trajectories, which are not only numeric, but are also kind of qualitative um, in, in orientation. And, and it seems to me there's a lot of interest in foresight right now especially post-COVID-19. So EMCDDA uh, launched their own foresight toolkit this year. WHO did the same uh, in relation to pandemics. The WHO say that uh, they've done this to set futures thinking in motion, to provoke imagination, to think beyond today's reality to a better tomorrow, and to take active steps to how to get there. There is then, through foresight, um, the idea of speculation, which is also actionable. Uh, it imagines a possible, yet a better future. So this is a kind of speculation that stretches beyond prediction, but which nonetheless resides in what others have termed the shadow of probabilities. It's still actionable. Five minutes. Five minutes, perfect. Sorry, I couldn't see that. <laughs> Anyway, we suggest that it would be very interesting to investigate foresight methods and how they're being put to use um, in, in the drugs policy field as, as a form of evidence making through speculation. Uh, I think it would be interesting to see how such initiatives might reconfigure outbreak in long view, in a longer past, as well as a longer future, as well as how they perform or are performed as, as evidence uh, for action. So before we conclude, um, uh, I want us to return to opioid overdose outbreak um, just for a few more moments. Um, so the speculative question, if we're going to think speculatively as something like foresight might encourage us to do, what might we work with um, as evidence, uh, as expertise, as narrative, for instance, that stretches our imaginations of the past and future beyond the short-term predictable? I guess that's the question we're going to be dealing with. Well, there's already two quite common narratives or scenarios in operation in relation to causation, uh, if you look at the science written about it on the US epidemic of opioid overdose. Uh, there's a narrative which is deaths of despair, and there's another narrative which is deaths of supply. Now, our interest, remember, is not to appraise these in terms of their epidemiological veracity or accuracy, but simply to present these as narratives, as a scaffold, if you like, for speculation, to signal how outbreak might be problematized in a longer term perspective. Now, in the deaths of despair narrative, which was first coined by Anne Case and Angus Deaton in 2015, the opioid epidemic resides in a half century process of deindustrialization. And this is entangling unemployment, underemployment, reduced pay, weakened labor unions, community and family disintegration, increased stress, ontological insecurity. And this fosters, they say, a kind of precarious condition which is conducive to drug demand, including as pain relief. And there are multiple studies which in their different ways kind of corner off or capture different parts of this narrative and the elements or pathways involved, and I think these offer up signs, if you like, or signals or indicators uh, which we might speculate with. Now, the narrative of deaths of despair entangles with one of supply, as I've said, and here the epidemic resides in a three-decade process linked to the pharmace pharmaceuticalization of society, and this is linked to the aggressive marketing and power of pharmaceutical companies, for instance, which is enabled by weak and slow regulations, which are then exacerbated, as we heard at the beginning of this talk, by the availability and use of heroin, as well as the introduction of fentanyl and other synthetics. Now, these are narratives, these are scenarios, these are speculations. Um, they clearly entangle together in most depictions, but the relative weight given to each 
and how the pathways of causation might be imagined or speculated and how the signs and signals and indicators might be delineated or described, they're going to differ and they're going to offer up multiple speculations of different kinds and alternative futures to deliberate around on causation in relation to overdose. So this is just an illustration, if you like, in terms of how foresight might think with uh, and build uh, scenarios. And here's a very specific example um, of such speculative work. This is based, um, this is work with Sam Friedman, Magdalena Serda and others. Um, uh, and it offers a very particular kind of reading, if you like, or scenario of, of um, uh, the long view of opioid overdose crisis. It narrates it basically as a class-based economic inequality. So this scenario traces the long view of outbreak back to post-war shifts in neoliberal society, enabling the right of companies to make profits, thereby producing economic inequalities, as well as recessions, two minutes, cool, weakened unions, weakened worker protections, as well as weakened social and public institutional supports. So in this narrative, economic inequalities are materialized in relation to work opportunity and workers' conditions, uh, including through work, you know, workplace injury, which produce communities of despair, which are managed through pain relief. Now again, our job is not to speculate right now whether this kind of narrative or scenario is right or wrong, but merely to illustrate it for its speculative potential in relation to scenario building about the long view of outbreak. It's clearly not predictive. Although Friedman actually suggests that some of it might be. But the long view of outbreak um, does therefore invite long-term solutions. It invites social and structural interventions. It invites an ongoing care and not merely a short-term and emergency response. So I'm going to conclude about how we might, might see outbreak differently as just food for thought, really. <laughs> so uh, our prime purpose, um, rather obviously by now, is to draw attention to the temporality of outbreak, how outbreak governs in relation to time, if you like, and specifically how outbreak as a configuration limits how outbreaks might be seen in particular ways. Um, and we've suggested that we can see shifts, signals, some of them very tentative, uh, in the practices of early warning and outbreak science itself, um, in how the problem of complexity is being kind of navigated, uh, which we can see as a prompt, uh, um, as, you know, as food for thought for doing things differently. So in conclusion, um, we'd like to draw attention to a particular sociological concept, which is called slow violence, as a way of seeing outbreak differently to how we normally do in our, in our thinking around early warning. Uh, slow violence reconfigures outbreak in long view, basically. Uh, in his book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, Rob Nixon writes this, and I, I think it's just as well I read it out. By slow violence, I mean a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight. A violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space. An attritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. Violence is customarily conceived as an event or action that is immediate uh, in time, explosive and spectacular in space, and is erupting into instant sensational visibility. And I think this is how we do tend to think about outbreak. We need, and I agree, uh, uh, to engage a different kind of violence, a violence that is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accretive, its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. I mean, rapid response is, of course, of our time. You know, a routine reflex and the promise of quick and technological fixes to social problems, which may not disappear as time moves on, as the case of opioid overdose tells us. But slow violence outbreak sees things differently. And most importantly, it shows us how rapid reflex responses and attention on the proximal and short term in the now can fail to address and even perpetuate the ongoing slow violence of crisis. So we're going to end this talk with just two proposals for the field. Um, this is our gesturing to, uh, oh, what might happen next? 
Number one, um, let's not only think of early warning of the drug, of the substance, but think beyond that, and um, even more so, think of ecological warning of the situation. Let us resist the temporal cuts the outbreak makes. Let us make early warning more long view and more ecological. Let us reach beyond the recent past and the proximal and the short term. And specifically, and maybe very practically, I think we can begin thinking about how to design up ecological and long view indicators of outbreak. And for me personally, I see that as a kind of sociological extension of Richard's pioneering epidemiological work on drug indicators. Secondly, uh, I think uh, it would be good not only to think about prediction, but to work a little bit creatively with speculation. So let us speculate as well as detect and predict. Let us move out of the shadow of probabilities, in fact. Let's get imaginative. Let's move beyond the limits of evidence-based epidemiological indicators and empirics. Let's incorporate multiple forms of expertise of different kinds. Let's use speculation as a deliberation, as an intervention, to think about what futures we would like to make. And most importantly, let's invite radical alternatives, not mere extensions of the present that we are familiar and used to, used to you know, live, living with. Specifically, I think this can also be practical. I think we could think about designing up some speculative exercises and interventions uh, uh, and do the speculative work in early warning and in outbreak. Uh, and also, I, I would like to see the, this new interest uh, in foresight as a way of doing this um, studied in practice. So there we go. That's the actual lecture. <laughs> and I just would like to thank everybody for listening. You know, it's very late in the day. It is a Friday. And maybe sociology is a little bit too much uh, at this point in time. So I do appreciate you kind of traveling with us on that. I'd like to thank Paul and the Scientific Committee once more. But my final word, I'd, I'd just like to thank Dagmar Hedrick, Richard's partner. Um, you know, she, she's helped me with various aspects of this presentation. So thank you, Dagmar. Thank you, thank you, Tim. Uh, we asked you to think out of the box. We asked you to challenge us a little bit, and you did just that. Um, I think that was a fitting first inaugural lecture in memory of Richard, and I look forward to the next one. Um, we now move to our last substantive presentation. Um, some of you have had long and difficult journeys to get here. I know this because I've spoken to you. Um, but trust me, none of you have had such an arduous and challenging journey as our next speaker. And I, I've, I can say that without any doubt in my mind. All of you who have worked here, worked in providing frontline services, know how challenging that can be. I think, however, none of us can really begin to appreciate how much more difficult this must be during a time of war. This is why the Programme Committee of Lisbon Addictions was particularly keen to finish our conference with a presentation on the situation in Ukraine. And in doing so, we wanted to also signal our support, our admiration, and our solidarity with all those providing health care in Ukraine during this very difficult period. I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Professor Irene Pinchuk. Irina is a psychiatrist and director of the Institute of Psychiatry at Travis Shekhandnov National University of Kyiv. She's also Vice President of the Ukrainian Psychiatric Association. Irina is also the head of Ukraine's chapter of the International Society of Substance Use Professionals. She has published extensively and is an editorial board member of the journal Addictology. During the war, Irina has continued her work and continued to be, work, be, be based in Kyiv in Ukraine and has been responsible for a study describing how support for people with substance use disorders have been impacted by the conflict. And this is the work that she will talk to us about today. In June, she became a member of a working group established at the Office of the First Lady of Ukraine to work on the National Programme for Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. I'd like to give you all to give now a really, really warm welcome to Professor Pinchuk.
Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, thank you all for this opportunity to be here today. On this first slide, my presentation, you can see the main building our university in the center of the Kiev after the Russian bombing. It was damaged by the blast. On February 24, on this year, the new period of my life began. Two weeks of nightmare, constant descending in the bomb shelter, up to seven times a day, lack of sleep during four days, trying to sleep sitting on chair, hugging a pillow, sounds of sirens, multiple launch rocket system, artillery, explosion, tears, fears, hatreds, and aggression towards to enemy. For a while, I thought about leaving uh, Ukraine and becoming a refugee. After two weeks, the realization of the need to live and fight for my country in my country. Now I will uh, say about my Ukraine. Ukraine is located in Eastern Europe and is one of the largest countries in the Europe. The population of Ukraine more than 41 million people. Uh, the country is divided into 27 uh, uh, administrative regions and the capital is Kiev with the three million uh, of uh, uh, people. Ukraine is very beautiful country with two seas, there are mountains, lakes, plants, steps and modern uh, cities. On this slide uh, you can see in the center the administrative building in the Kharkov before the Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, on this slide, you can see this building after the Russian bombing. You also see the central square in Kiev during uh, the blackout period today. Uh, Russia destroyed more than 50% of the critical infrastructure of Ukraine, which provide the population with electricity, heating, uh, and the internet. According to official information uh, in August this year, the biggest losses are from the destruction of housing, roads and uh, bridges, factories and industrial enterprises, airports, sports and railways, institution of education and culture. The damage of military infrastructure is significantly less than the damage of civilian object. Today, Russia is destroying the civilian infrastructure which provided uh, the population with uh, heating, water, electricity, gas, communication. In many regions today, people live without the usual comfort. Last three, week, uh, three weeks in my home, we haven't had electricity 12 uh, hours every day. Since uh, 2014, 13% of territory of Ukraine was uncontrolled uh, due to the occupation of the Crimea territory and uh, the anti-terrorist operation in eastern Ukraine. During the first three months uh, the war this uh, year, 21% uh, of Ukraine country's territory was temporarily occupied by Russia Federation. Today, um, the situation uh, changing every day, and uh, we believe in the liberation of all territory of Ukraine. The situation is Ukraine has an impact on the situation in other countries. Massive forced migration, disruption of energy resources, disruption of food resources. 40% of world food program grain comes from Ukraine. Nuclear crisis, 
economic crisis worldwide, crisis of international law. A lot of today, 32% uh, of population of Ukraine uh, refugee. Among them, uh, 5 million internally displaced in Ukraine, 8 million externally displaced, and among them, 4 million uh, children, a lot of them uh, unaccompanied. According to the official data in September, almost a million and a half uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, were in Poland. Uh, about a million in Germany, more than um, 400,000 in Czech Republic and also in uh, uh, many other countries. Unfortunately, uh, the war takes the leaves of our medical workers. Uh, from uh, an interview with the Ministry of Ministry Health, uh, 29 civilian medical workers were killed and more than uh, 100 were injured. The day before yesterday, the first day of our uh, conference, after another rocket uh, attacks, there was a hit in the neonatal unit. Two doctors were injured and a child uh, who was two days old was killed. Uh, the Ministry of Health also record internally displaced medical workers, the number of whom is more than 4,200. Most of them found employment in another medical institutions. According to the data, Ukrainian Psychiatric Association, uh, 648 employers of psychiatric hospital were uh, displaced or fired. Since uh, the beginning of the war, 1,100 healthcare facilities were damaged by the Russian military. Uh, 144 hospitals were completely destroyed and uh, cannot be restored. Uh, what about the psychiatric hospital? Before the war, uh, we had 62 psychiatric hospitals. Now 10 psychiatric hospitals were destroyed and six of them completely uh, destroyed. I would like to see you, uh, uh, our psychiatric hospital after Russian uh, attacks. Uh, the one uh, was uh, uh, destroyed in May and uh, one other, uh, one um, other two in uh, September. Uh, when our psychiatric hospital are destroyed, our patients and our healthcare workers also suffer. Unfortunately, among the healthcare workers, there are also 22 victims. Uh, six of them were injured and nine died. This is what we know today. The died medical workers uh, were not only on the territory of active hostilities. You can see on map, unfortunately, all regions of Ukraine today are suffering. Our patients also evacuated from the eastern part of Ukraine to the western part, fleeing artillery shelling and airstrikes. Yesterday, 100 uh, patients evacuated from Kherson to Odessa because uh, Russia has completely destroyed uh, the city, the civilian infrastructure in Kherson. Now in our hospital in Kherson, all the patients, uh, 200 patients without the electricity, heating and water. Uh, now I would like uh, to bring your attention a short video about the war in Ukraine in order to understand the consequences on this war.
we conduct a short, quick uh, survey. We ask our colleague to describe Russian war in Ukraine. The result uh, is shown on this slide. I think it doesn't need an explanation. Um, the situation in Ukraine is very dynamic and change every day. Uh, International Technology Transfer Center in Ukraine conducted a study in August this year. Uh, the purpose of uh, this research fixed the state of the certain moment of provision of special medical care for people with substance use disorders in Ukraine during the war. More than 90 documents were selected for analysis and 80% of these documents were published after the beginning of the Russia war in Ukraine. Uh, so the main consequences closing of healthcare facility uh, because of fighting, destruction, and occupation of uh, territories. Destruction and close of the pharmaceutical factories that produced methadone. Lack of necessary stock of drug in uh, pharmacies. Uh, disruption of supply roads within in the country the impact of drug shortages to the black market for drugs and increasing prices. Limited access to medical supplies, including methadone and naloxone, reducing the dosage of drug due to lack of drug. Shortage of staff and additional workload for staff. Part of staff was mobilized part was evacuated. The need to evacuate patient and staff. 29 healthcare facility uh, that offered med services closed due to occupation of territory, disruption, stopping to delivery of the drug, lack of medical workers. More than 1,300 patients received care in this institution. An increasing number of people with substance use uh, disorders seeking special medical care services in the central and uh, uh, western part of Ukraine. Um, the practice of um, waiting, uh, the practice of, of waiting uh, uh, list in the central and the western part of Ukraine. Uh, problems of access match due to lack of documents among uh, um, internally displaced person. Stopping the activities of some private sites. Uh, more than uh, 300 patients of uh, private clinics who receive match have been uh, registered in a new place uh, of residence. Uh, the demand uh, for the overdose prevention services tripled after the start of the war, changing the regulatory framework uh, to increase the availability of care. For example, uh, community outreach teams receive permission to distribute methadone and buprenorphine. A prescription was allowed it for three, uh, uh, 30 days and uh, others. Uh, due to constant uh, hostilities, occupation, damage to infrastructure, disruption of logistics, the match program in the occupied territories has been completely stopped. Uh, most patients have left their homes and moved to safe region. Uh, there is no information about the patient in the occupied territories. Talking about uh, the service uh, provision for people with substance use disorders on abroad, I would like to note uh, that uh, prohibition for men younger than 60 years to travel abroad, uh, the problem of accessing medical facility to confirm disability for people with substance use disorders, and little cooperation has been established to help such patient abroad. Before the um, uh, war, uh, the MED program in nine criminal justice sittings began uh, to work in Ukraine, last open uh, on February 22, two days before the war. 
uh, in temporarily occupied uh, territories, closing the MAD program in uh, three penitentiary institutions, evacuated of prisoners to region where there was access to MAD program, and Ministry of Justice continues to implement um, MAD in facility located on territory of Ukraine during the war. One new um, uh, program uh, was uh, open. Um, in Ukraine. Uh, we can talk about uh, a lot about the lesson learned. I decided to give with the following. Uh, the unpreparedness uh, of the existing public mental health system to quickly respond to an emergency. Slow and insufficient changing the structural organization and functional feeling of state structure under the influence of humanitarian assistance during uh, eight years. Lack of safe shelter with necessary stock of supplies, strategic food, uh, hygiene and medical supplies. Uh, adventures of mobile form of mental health care. We organized this form before the war, and now it, this form is very helpful for us. Um, advantage um, of online form of communication, both among staff and with patients. Uh, pandemic uh, COVID helped us and prepared us to work is, uh, in this uh, uh, time. Lack of uh, outreach activity in the mental um, health. Um, lack of understanding of trauma-informed care and awareness of the needs of distribution of responsibilities through interdepartmental coordination. Uh, despite the war, we continue our activity. Um, as a, a country coordination international technology transfer center uh, of Ukraine and uh, organize a, a chapter, national chapter, international society of substance use professional. Uh, we do uh, a lot. Uh, we organized um, uh, last six week a serious webinar uh, about the topic of war psychological skills for uh, surviving and coping with traumatic events on current topic about the uh, refugee, children, elderly people, military um, treatment, um, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder. Uh, we organized uh, the series of consultation um, webinar of, uh, about the um, substance use prevention. Uh, to desk uh, review, one uh, on addition services provision during the war, and another review of curriculums of substance use treatment and prevention in a pre-postgraduate sitting. Uh, translated and adaptation of manual of traumatic brain injury. Of course, we participate in the conference. Uh, four uh, scientific uh, articles have been published this year, the last uh, uh, about the mental health uh, helpline staff in Ukraine uh, during the war. Uh, this is our first uh, lady. Uh, in response uh, to the challenge of the war time in June this year, the Office of the First Lady, the Ministry of Health of Ukraine, and partners launched the National Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Program which aims to ensure full and effective access to psychological care for all people affected the war. Uh, we hope that our activity will uh, implement in this uh, program. May there soon be peace in Ukraine and around the world. Until that time comes, let us be Invivering in our commitment to work together for safe, healthy, and just world for all. I would like to say all people from different countries who help uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian. I would like uh, to thank organizer uh, this uh, event uh, for. 
possibility to be here and uh, uh, talk about my Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene. I think you've um, humbled many of us by your presentation on providing health care under such difficult circumstances. I know many of us have a hard job, but I think you particularly have a very hard job, and we very much appreciate the efforts you've made to join us here today. Thank you again very much for your presentation. And after that, it's a great pleasure for me now to convene this part of the, the program, and we will move now to our closing ceremony. Thank you very much for your attention.